Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time, a Wave Sports and Entertainment original presented by Prize Picks. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Subscribe, like, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Um, we got UNLV and Duke playing tonight. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. I understand some of you youngsters might not know what I mean, but the old heads know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, Sean, I did not get to see it live with my own eyes last night. Well, I got to see a different it last night. Um, uh, some friends of mine came into town and I got some tickets to go see, uh, the Nets and the Lakers at Barclays, so I was there for LeBron, um, apparently, like, just thought it was wild, and it didn't even feel like it there, first of all, the Lakers were up 17 to nothing, okay, there's that, the Lakers were up 17 to nothing, I'm there with my buddy's son, my man is 14 years old, and he was like, yo, I want to, he thought, but he wanted to go get a jersey, I say, cool, I take him over to the shop, but then we had the question about the Nets, I really hadn't thought about it, which is, damn, who jersey they sell? Like, you know, Mikael Bridges, we knew that. But after that, I was like, I don't really know who played for these dudes. So it's the Cam Thomas dude. I, I mean, I, like, I heard of these dudes once I seen them, for the most part. Um, I, I didn't know this, though, Sean. The Lakers got a new white dude, Castleton. I didn't know that. I never heard of this cat, but go look at him. He, I, he out there. I think his name was Castleton. But he, like, he, he just... He seemed a bit more in the archetype than Austin Reeves, who got like a lot of stuff going on all at one time. But this Castleton dude, like he looked like he always where he's supposed to be. You know, that's how he got here. That Colin Castleton. Is he from like Ireland or one of them countries? He's from uh, Pembroke Pines, Florida. Oh, Miami-ish. Okay. Huh. Oh, let me tell you what that tells me also. Buddy, uh, he from uh, he from the Pines. He might talk a little bit, like, not totally like uh, Isaiah Hartenstein. Did you see that? Uh, it just truly blew my mind. You tweeted how you knew, kind of, that he was yeah. not a full-on Isaiah, like, you know, a white yeah, Isaiah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, no, let's throw this up right fast, right? Just a picture of Isaiah Hartenstein because it becomes very important. And so for me, I couldn't quite figure this out because his name was Isaiah Hartenstein. And then once you see the picture of him, you'll understand I was trying to do my research and see if I could find out if he was an Isaiah or a Hartenstein, right? And the one time I went to a game at Madison Square Garden, they were playing against the Hornets. And let me tell you something, the crowd thinks he's a Hartenstein. And by the way, his Hartenstein, I don't even think it's the Hartenstein that they thought it was. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't even that kind of Hartenstein. I got the feeling, I, I was feeling solidarity from the crowd in his hartenstein because every time he put up a bucket, you could hear... <gasps> Like, it'd be a gasp, and there was the excitement and the hope. And then when he make it, boy, they was a little bit happier when he made shots than they were when Mitchell Robinson made one. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, people are trying to figure out, is he Isaiah or Hartenstein? And I'm guessing that's a picture of his dad next to him to let you know it's actually a little bit of both. He is an Isaiah in the sense that we are talking about, but he, he is dad German, so he a Hartenstein also, which is the different Hartenstein than I think, because I was talking... I was talking to my agent about it. And he was like, I don't even think that. <laughs> he's like, I don't think he's down with the crew. I, I'm dumb, boy, you want to talk about you want to talk about tap dancing through the raindrops right now. I'm dancing through all the raindrops. Sean, thanks for coming on the screen at the same time so I wouldn't be alone while all this was going on. But anyway, I watched LeBron. They was out there toy with them cats, man. Like LeBron was just hitting all the threes. I didn't fully realize what a role he was on because I realize when I'm at games how much I depend on the announcers to let me know like what's going on. You can have 75 points. I'm not going to notice while I'm watching the game, right? Like, and I need the announcer to be like, yo, it's a 10-2 run. I need somebody. Otherwise, I'll just look up and be like, damn, the game has gotten out of hand. Um, but they was toying with him. LeBron doing step backs on him. I didn't realize he was just killing it like that until, until everybody in the crowd started standing up when he was getting the ball. Like, it was a, it was a Lakers home game. At that point, at that point, totally the Lakers whole game. I mean, nine threes is insane. It's just really funny that you were like, you told me you went to the game last night and you're like, yeah, it didn't seem like LeBron was doing that much. I was like, he's never had nine threes in his career in year Don't 21. 
I didn't realize it was that many. Maybe, I don't know how many they be hit at the end. Because, like, with three minutes left, I'm like, look, they're not going to lose this game. And we need to get on the subway before everybody else do. Right? Like, I got out-of-towners with me. I got to go about this in a different way. Uh, but, yeah, he was just, it, it was just kind of nuts. You know, let me tell you something I did see that was interesting. And then we'll get back to the actual matter at hand. A lot of LeBron jerseys. A lot of purple and gold LeBron jerseys. A few... Um, wine and gold LeBron jerseys and a couple of green and gold LeBron jerseys from uh, the St. Vincent St. Mary's era. Interestingly, no Miami Heat LeBron jerseys. A um, lot of Kobe jerseys. Didn't see any Anthony Davis jerseys. Um, he apparently has not motivated the faithful to invest any money, even though he ain't going nowhere. Like, I don't know why. They're just not really, they ain't really get on board with the Anthony Davis thing. But anyway, that's where I was on Sunday night, which stopped me from watching what was captivating America. Sean, I did get to watch most of the first game with Purdue in Tennessee. Um, that was the first time, I'll be honest with you, that I had watched Purdue play a game uh, since. They told me Robbie Hummel was on the radio uh, doing Purdue games, and I was like, good for him finally getting himself a degree. Roddy, Rob, Robbie Hubble seemed, Rob, Robbie Hubble, like the, before COVID, you know what I'm saying? Robbie Hubble seemed like he stayed there long enough to get a farm D. He seemed like he was in school forever. But I watched uh, the Zach Eady dude, and number one, no, he's not going to be any good in the NBA. I can't believe we, anybody has a problem with that notion. But number two, you can't do shit with him in college, man. How tall is he? About eight four? He's just like eight four and wide. There's nothing. It got just enough touch. Can't nobody do nothing with him. It's it's funny how like he's his game's definitely you're right his game's not gonna translate at the NBA pro level but watching yeah. him in college you're like how many guys do you need <laughs> do you need five guys to stop this man he looked like he just need to do that thing where he just hold the ball over his head and everybody just kind of jump up and down trying to get to it like bro he, he cut he the just... nets down without the ladder I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. There's nothing anybody can do with them at this level. At the next level, they'll be pitching his shit into the third row. He will never even get, hold up. He'll be trying to get back to the other end. Like, slow down, man. Slow down, man. I'm going to be there in a minute. I'm going to be there. They said uh, he's going to be the tallest player in the NBA next to Boban and Wembenyama. I was like, yes. two of the three guys can't do shit in the NBA at that height. <laughs> Yo. Well, what Boba can do in the NBA is make people feel good. Like, I think the thing that Zach Eady does need to start working on is, hey, buddy, you're going to need to smile a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? You're going to need to get out here and get, yeah, get some jokes. In fact, you might want to pick up an accent. That's gone a long way from Boban. You know what I'm saying? They, then, then you can start getting in some movies, right? George Mears said he got to be in a movie with Billy Crystal. You know, like. That's the direction he need to go in. Instead, he just looked like a great value Yao Ming. It is, yeah, it, it is It is fascinating, and it is a very boring brand of basketball. I, no offense to Purdue at all. I just can't watch them play basketball. Oh, God, Big Ten basketball is its own. Oh, I didn't realize that Edie, I'm learning all kinds of things about him now that I am inquiring for the first time. So he is actually 7'4". It just doesn't seem like it. Wow, his mom is 6'3". Yeah, they showed her in the sidelines a bunch, or on the in the court, like you know, sitting at the court. Oh. They just they just kept zoning in on her. Wow! So he's seven four, and he's three hundred pounds. Okay, my Yao Ming thoughts. Okay, and his people from over there. Okay, not as far off. Like, are you familiar? I think his name is Juan Antonio Vargas. Yep. Yep. He is the, the I guess the activist, the right term, undocumented immigrant or whatever. But I couldn't figure out. I just saw his name and that he was an undocumented, undocumented immigrant. And I did a little bit too much assuming. And I was like, yo, I don't understand how it is that this Mexican look like Yao Ming. And they let me know that. <laughs> it, didn't make, it didn't make any sense to me. But it turned out he was Filipino, not Mexican. I just. I just did a little bit too. I took it one step too far. I, I will say it's a pretty. It, that's a, a, the Filipino Mexican mistake is a little yeah. bit more common, I think, especially in Southern I California. Didn't tell him, 
I did a television show for two years with a Filipino that I thought was Mexican for a year or two before I found out otherwise. I mean, I knew he wasn't Mexican by the time we did the TV show together. But yeah, I thought Pablo was Mexican. His name was the, Pablo. The last names. The last names really, you know, yeah. cross over a lot. Yeah, Pablo Torre. I mean, you know, I think he was covering boxing at the time. Like, yeah, like, I, in fact, that's what it was. One day before I knew him like that, we was on the internet talking about De La Hoya Mayweather. And I was like, oh, okay. I just, I thought he was Mexican. I'm from Houston, man. You got to realize something. It took a long time in my life for me to stop operating on the you Mexican because of not enough information to think that you was Mexican. When I was seven years old and we moved to Houston, I understood that just because somebody was well, we called it Hispanic at the time, but I understood that just because somebody was Latino, it did not mean they were Mexican. I grasped that at seven years old, 10 years in Houston later, and I was like, oh, wait, that's a Mexican. That's what Houston will do to you, right? right like that, that, that's where Houston will get your mind. And then I snapped out of it, and then it simply became a case of, nah, I can just probably readily identify somebody as being Mexican. But then I had the Mexican Yao Ming, and it turned out that he was Filipino. Uh, someone, Sammy Leonard on YouTube said he saw people on Twitter call Edie Fao Ming. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's unfair. He doesn't deserve that. He's the player of the year. He has 30 and 15 in all the tournament games, if I'm not mistaken. He's been a bit of a beast, but that ain't who, that ain't who the people here to talk about, Sean. That's not who they here to talk about. We, I feel like, can we get our props for being ahead of this? Because we told people that this was coming. We told people that DJ Burns would be a beloved figure. Could you put Fat Pat on the screen right fast? Because I just don't think they understand, man. Fat Pat was out there giving it to him. This is him talking to the Duke fans when the game was over. He told him, your season is over. Your season is over. Tell him it's donezo, DJ. Tell him it's donezo. Hit him with the donezo. There it is, donezo. Dunzo, we got a whole new generation of players, man. They be giving it right back to them dorks. I love it, right? Carolina, boy, them boys be standing there and waving at them dorks. I've, it's a whole new thing, man. I love it. I love seeing it. And, Sean, did you watch the game and see DJ Burns in action? Uh, it, was, it was like watching Zach Randolph on steroids. It just, like, between <laughs> footwork and touch around the rim, it was a thing of beauty. And he, you know, Filipowski was guarding him. He had stood no chance all game. So I watched the highlights, and I want to make a couple of points, right? The, the Zach Randolph comparison we make a lot is fair, except he is so much fatter than Zach, Zach Randolph was. Yeah, right? totally, and, totally. And, and I watched Zach Randolph play a year in college, and it felt like 20 years in the NBA, and I saw more highlights of great passes from DJ Burns in that game than 20 years of the Zach Randolph experience. This is not like, that's not what Zebo was providing. You were right, the Filipowski dude was guarding him, and Sean, me and you were kind of new to this, um, a lot of the people that go back and you know go back a ways with your boys, they with your boy, they gonna know what I'm talking about right now, and that is this: Kyle Filipowski, who I think will be a decent NBA player, is a very tall guy, but that's what he is. He is tall man. Okay, he's not big man. He is tall man, and tall man was given the task of guarding fat man, okay? There's a difference between tall man and big man. I tell people about this all the time. After I had the growth spurt and I got a little bigger and I'm tall, I'm tall such that I am a 4-5 in most pickup games by height, but, I mean, y'all see me, or at least you've seen me before, and this is as big as I have ever been, Okay. So I'll be out there and teams start picking up. I'm going to get you. All right, I got you. I got you. And then people start sizing up their roster and they realize what they need. And then they look at me and they be like, all right, big man. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is means I'm going to be asked. This means I'm going to be asked to guard somebody that I can't. I ain't really got nothing for. Right. And so I'm tall, man. I'm not big man. My brother would make reference to some people. He'd be like, you know, especially if they tall and they're not good. Tall and that's all. That's all they provide. Well, Kyle Filipowski is not tall and that's all. He provides other things, but he's tall man. And tall man was on the fat man's back the whole game. And there's nothing tall man can do with that. There just isn't. He could get that shoulder around him and get to anything that he wanted to do. And he got enough touch and guile because DJ Burns is 38 years old, right? I didn't realize that. He's in year six 
right? He started in 2018. He one of those guys. No wonder you're out here having that much fun. He got a whole nother perspective on life that these young guys don't have. By the time you get to be as old as he is, you know that you got to embrace these moments. The basketball team starting to look like the goddamn band where you'd be like, shit, man, you on the tuba. How long have you been here? Like, don't you want to move on with your life? But anyway, he was turning that shoulder and then getting around, dude. There's nothing he could do. He could put it on the ground and give him just a little bit of that hook. What nothing he could do. Reaching around, throwing them cats, them passes. Like, this, well, it was, it was just watching. We've seen it before in real life. He has the athleticism of just a real-life fat man playing in the post at his age. Just all guile. And, dude. NC State, and I'm going to get to like the particularities of the NC State of it all in just a second. But this dude and what he was doing, they made in the second half of that game 70% of their contested shots. 70% of contested shots. They were, it was just kind of magic like that, right? Like that was just what it was. But I want to talk about a bit of a different angle from this, okay? And so, as many of you know, I lived in Durham for 10 years. I went to graduate school at UNC. I've taught at Duke. I worked out of Raleigh for a few years. You know, like, I know the area. I know the schools. I know the people very well. And I look up, and it's Duke versus NC State with a Final Four berth on the line. And I know UNC fans rooting for a bomb threat, right? But I want to break, but, but I mean, there's just, there's, there's not a lot of win in there for them. So it's like, I want to break down for you some of the sociology behind what was going on with this game and everything else, all right? So I called one of my partners. I'm going to leave him unnamed for his own sake here. And, well, the, the question I had for all my UNC fan friends was, who are you rooting for? Because I knew who I was rooting for, and I was rooting for who I root for in every game. The team that's playing against Duke. I once wrote for the whole world to see that if Duke played the Ku Klux Klan, I'd root for a 0-0 tie. And I don't know why people think I'm joking. Like, I'm, I'm, I have no idea who Duke would have to play for me to, to, to root against them. They were like, yo, what about Duke and the Russians? Like, I mean, I got disagreements with the Russians, but I wouldn't call it beef. You know, like, like, it's just, I don't, like, yeah, I don't know who Duke would have to play for me to not, right, so I found that just about all of my black friends still rooting against Duke, no matter what. It was NC State, like, I got a group text with three of the closest, three of my closest friends, and somebody just <laughs> jumped in on Sunday morning with, and I quote, fuck it, go state. <laughs> And everybody was on the same program. It was a no-brainer. Yeah, you go for state. Because, like, especially if you a Carolina fan of a certain age, right, you ain't got no real animosity towards state. They ain't never done nothing to you. You don't remember them doing anything to you. But, but, if you grew up in eastern North Carolina, and that's where state fans are more prevalent, so once you start getting east of I-95, right, or just really east of Raleigh, but once you start getting east, then those people were rooting against state because they were rooting against state fans. You see what I'm saying? Like they were, they were dealing with it in a different way. And then you catch cats, and I mean, they just, they, they, they the kind of white where it comes down to, yeah, I've hang out with state fans, you know? If I have the choice between hanging out with a bunch of state fans and hanging out with a bunch of Duke fans, I'd rather hang out with a bunch of state fans. And so they go there. And by the way, I agree with that too. I get, you know, I get and I understand where it is that they're coming from. But I also have to acknowledge this. I could say that I wanted NC State to win that game because I don't live there no more, okay? And by the way, I do notice that somebody in the chat room has put in, if you can't go to college, go to state, which sounds like somebody who was rooting for the team that lost yesterday. But I just, I do like... I can say this because I don't live there anymore. And I personally cannot imagine how insufferable and annoying state fan is. They got the men's and women's team into the final four the same day. Okay. That bass fishing team no longer has to carry the day. 
They baseball team been out here doing work, making things happen. You know, they've been going after just a general state of misery, man. The football team better than it used to be. Um, Because I always said that I thought state fans got a bad rap, especially in basketball, because they didn't want to be as good as Duke and Carolina. They just didn't want to be sorry no more. And I thought that that was a perfectly reasonable thing for them to just not want to be sorry no more. So, like, I had their back when it came to that, right? Um, They're going to be the worst. Because now they're going to, like, not all of them, but enough of them going to think. They're going to put together the reasons why they can be as good as Duke and Carolina. And so I was just hoping and thinking and kind of wishing in a way if there was some way that Duke could have lost that game, but NC State didn't go to the Final Four. Like if there was a way to thread that needle, that would have been optimal. And that doesn't really have anything to do with Carolina. I'm just telling you, it's got everything to do with them. But just so you know, in case it ever comes up again, okay? Just, just, just so everybody gets it. Duke could be playing everybody that ever fired me. I'm taking the firers and the points. All right, like whatever it takes. I give you what, whatever it takes. But the <laughs> also found the chubbier the friend, the more likely they were to root for NC State. So, Sean, the game of all games is tonight. This is the biggest matchup, I think, in college basketball of the couldn't year. Couldn't get anything bigger. Men's, women's, Couldn't get matter. anything bigger. Couldn't get anything. For, how about this? It's the biggest basketball matchup. There's nothing in the NBA that you could put together that would be as compelling as Iowa playing against LSU on Monday night. There's nothing that you could put together. This is it. You have the defending champions on one side, the best player in the country on the other side, one of the single greatest players of all time. You got what went down last year. You got the backdrop of Kim Mulkey and uh, the Washington Post article that was kind of more of a fart. You know, big stinker. Yeah, big fart, just a bit of a fart. You know, not really. I thought it was fairly interesting, but, you know, bit of a bit of a fart. That's all it was. Um, you got that. Like, we've had a year to get going with this. You know, white folks don't know how to act. So you got what happened with the UCLA-LSU game and the dude at the LA Times that wrote the, the Dirty Debutantes versus whatever we call them, Milk and Cookies or whatever he called um, Iowa's team. Like, and I'm just like... I, you know what, I, I'm obviously that man is responsible for his own words, but he sent that to somebody who had the opportunity to stop it. You know what I mean? Like that is, that is not a failure of the writer. That is a failure of the institution. That is a failure of processes. That is a failure of editing. That is a failure of awareness. It is not a failure that just simply goes to the one guy who wrote it. Everybody dropped the ball, but at the same time, appreciate you because now you can stop acting like I be making this stuff up. You dig what I'm saying? I'm here for it. Like, look, this game tonight is going to feel a lot like Duke versus UNLV in 1991. I've had people push back on it for a number of small reasons, and I'm saying stop being so anal. Just you know what my point is, okay? This ain't about so much being 100% right. You get what it is. We had this game last year, and now you're going to come back this year, and you got LSU and how they get down. I mean, LSU got a girl on their team who's named after her daddy's rap name. Okay? Like, on the other side, Iowa. I don't have to I mean, like, oh, you think yourself, oh, I wonder what Iowa's women's basketball team look like. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they look like. Like, this is, this is what it is. This is what it's going to be. It's what it kind of came down to at the end of the game last year. Not necessarily anything to do with the players themselves, but everything to do with the people who are watching the games. Everything to do with their tendencies toward projections and everything else. We got that, and I got to be honest, it made me feel nostalgia, and I loved it. It was kind of fun. Okay, it's, it's like one of them boxing matches. It's like watching wrestling. All right, we got these things. They come up, sports bring them out. I feel like this is relatively harmless as long as you don't necessarily go too far. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if y'all remember it. There we go. There's Andrew Reese from last year out there being obnoxious, but somehow came, became people's hero, right? 
I'll never, I will never be able to understand. Wow, Kim was, that's right, that's when Kim wore the penny suit. He said, when it go back around, you look at it, Kim Monkey looked like she got on a bunch of pennies, a bunch of brand new pennies too. Like they just rolled them pennies out. There it is. You see them, you see them pennies. But anyway, Andrew Reese became people's hero for that. And I'm just like, wow, what a terribly low bar. But anyway, it's, I mean, it really is just, a, just an incredibly low bar. But it was also a really good basketball game. Like there's so many levels to what this is going to be. It starts at 7 o'clock, so I ain't got to stay up all late to try to get at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern. Eastern, got to remember y'all ain't all in the same place. I cannot wait to see this. I can't. Sean, people tried to make the argument that this was not directly like UNLV Duke. And look, there was, by the way, the Dirty Debbie Tots versus Milk and Cookies column, those columns were being written before UNLV Duke. That was the point. That, that's where I was going on this, right? Like, you do, you do have the ways that people are going to do things, and you got the fact that they played against each other last year. You got all of that, and the biggest pushback that people gave me on the direct comparison was, yeah, but Kim Mulkey, all right? And I get you, but, like, Barry Switzer used to coach Oklahoma. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you can make that point about her, and I get it. You're like, I would never root for Kim Mulkey. That's fine. I don't know who exactly you think you're rooting for. She's just a little louder about what's going on. But Caitlin Clark, for example, be tooling around with the MAGA governor of Iowa, right? I don't know how much say-so she has in that, but the fact is that she does it. So what you going to do? You going to root for that over Kim Mulkey if you claiming that it's on a matter of on, on political principle? Is that what you about to do? Right, exactly. It, it's, Stop trying to be anal jerks. It's one of those games that's like, I think, bulletproof from any outside narrative because the actual like you said the actual basketball and the narratives on the court are so good that it's automatically must watch tv you know just like yes, watch the fucking no game yeah but nothing is bulletproof from outside narratives because what we have been taught over time is how to make anything actually about ourselves right like the whole game this is my man postman was talking about amusing ourselves to death that like the approach of advertising for example advertising is not about the products advertising is about you Right. So whenever something is being sold, it's not about the product itself that's being offered. You present it in a way that makes it about the person. This is how this thing is going to make you feel. If you're this kind of person, this is what you do. If you're that kind of person, this is what you do all the way up and down the line. And this game gives it to you 100 percent. Like, Sean, I was looking at this uh, before I came out here uh, to get started where they had a, a chart of um, where the starters for the men's teams, uh, where they all started their college careers. And I don't think NC State had a single player who started his college career at NC State. Yeah, DJ Burns started at Tennessee, and I think the same goes yes. for mostly the whole roster, like you're saying, which is yeah. the, the yeah. new age of college basketball, right? Yeah, but this game, these, these women were there last year, although I have to be honest. They could go to Home Depot and pick up 12 white girls and switch out the ones that aren't Caitlin Clark, and I would be none the wiser. I'd have absolutely no idea. I don't know none of their names. I don't know their positions outside of setting screens. I have no idea what they contribute. Like normally when you get somebody like Kayla Clark, especially if it's a white folks around them, you start building up everybody else, right? Like when Duke was on TV all the time, you knew everybody on that team because they was going to make sure that you knew that white guy works really hard or the defensive stopper. Every, every one of the big teams got some dude they claim is a defensive stopper who ain't that good that defense Carolina had one of them called Marcus Ginyard he was a good dude he wasn't a bad player but they was out here making that dude sound like Stacey Augman and it wasn't true yeah yeah Sean you can pull that up there I don't know who none of them people are it don't matter it don't matter you can get them out of there put on the add, um, add the Spice Girls and throw on uh what I don't know some more of them I, don't, I ain't got no idea if the four non-blondes I would have no idea man you could you could you could fool me any way that you want to, right? This is Caitlin. This is <laughs> this is Caitlin Clark versus them. <laughs> it's, it's Caitlin Clark versus all y'all, as far as I'm concerned. We got a comment know. on YouTube. Caitlin and the four heartbeats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. It's Caitlin and the Bangles. Caitlin and the Go Go's. <laughs> I ain't got that much that I can provide to be helpful. I really can't. And this is going to be dope. It really is. It really, really is. It's just, it does. And this is the thing about it. And I know that some people out here, 
that'll chastise me for not knowing and that I die, whatever, I don't care. What makes this dope and what I think is great about all of this is that it almost doesn't matter who anybody is, <laughs> right? Everything is built in a way just to make this compelling. And it is your friendly reminder. Teams are what sell, right? Franchises and consistency are the things that sell. And I have heard dudes talk about being excited about this. I've heard women talk about being excited about this. I've just seen it on so many levels. That crowd, that crowd gonna be cracking. Sean, you ever seen Harlem Knights? I have not. I should. All right. So the oh it, it's I mean it's 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 up there. It's up there. But the the like well, the com the combination of the movie is a boxing match, you know, it's back in the day, like the twenties, thirties, whatever, but it's a boxing match between a black fighter and a white fighter. And I can't remember which one was first, the white fighter or the black fighter, but half the half the crowd is clapping and cheering for the one, and then they talk about the other one and it goes immediately a shift. <laughs> the one group sits down and gets quiet, everybody else stand up and start clapping. <laughs> That's gonna be the I'm sorry, that's, that's this gonna matchup. be the night and it's gonna be hilarious. It's jokes, man. I every time I talk, oh, why are y'all making it about race? Cause that's just how it worked, man. Okay. I didn't make it that way. It's gonna make it hilarious. And boy, I tell you too. <sighs> we all gotta be honest about this, man. It made white people a little salty. When, especially if it's basketball, they lose one of these matchups, right? But in the end, white people kind of feel like they're playing with house money on those things. But my people, my people, when it go the wrong way for us, man, like I feel like, I feel like sometimes you walk around feeling like you got no direction, no purpose. Nobody to love you for you. We don't feel right. Don't feel right. We don't like we don't like it when white people assume we all good at basketball, but we really don't like it when they better. Ugh. Could be rough. Could be rough. Gonna be a great night. I'm having a great time doing this podcast. Let's go sell some stuff. March is over. But the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April. Be a part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with basketball, hockey, and college basketball entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. And if you stick around for the end of the show, you'll hear picks from our producer, Sean, that could potentially help you win big. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. So make sure you go to prizepicks.com slash Bomani and use code BOMANI for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prize picks slash BOMANI. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. How's your social battery right now? Has the mad dash to start the new year both professionally and socially exhausted you? It can be easy to ignore our social battery and spread ourselves thin, especially as social gatherings pick up with the nicer weather. How do you take care of your social battery? Is it setting more boundaries to make more time for yourself? Therapy can give you the self-awareness to build a social life that doesn't drain your battery. Therapy can help give you the balance you need in your life to maintain a healthy lifestyle. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Bomani today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bomani. Let's talk hydration. You chugging water throughout the day or periodically having a glass? Hydration is really important for a healthy lifestyle. And if you use Liquid IV, which has three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, you can hydrate even faster. Liquid IV is super easy to use. 
Just take a pre-measured packet and pour it into a glass of water, mix it up, and enjoy. You can take it at home before you start your day or take it with you to work or the gym. Plus, with their roster of flavors, which includes my favorite, Lemon Lime, you can easily find the right flavor for you and your taste buds. However you hydrate, grab Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier Sugar-Free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code BOMANI at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code BOMANI at liquidiv.com. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you. Now, if you haven't heard. All right, Bo, here's our first clip of the day. Hi, this is Louise Matsakis. I'm a freelance journalist covering technology in China. I have a news story in The Atlantic headlined, The End of Foreign Language Education. From 2009 to 2021, enrollment in language courses other than English at American colleges decreased 29.3%. There's a lot of different explanations for this trend, including pandemic-related school disruptions, growing isolationism, and funding cuts to humanities programs. But it's also true that people are turning away from language learning just as AI translation is becoming ubiquitous across the internet. Neural networks, the same technology that powers things like ChatGPT, have made machine translation much better than it used to be. Now, companies like Spotify, Samsung, and Roblox are starting to roll out new AI translation features. Musicians are using the technology to translate songs, and at least one couple I came across credit it with helping them to fall in love. Within a few years, these AI translation tools may become so commonplace and frictionless that billions of people take for granted the fact that the emails they receive, videos they watch, and albums they listen to were originally produced in a language other than their native one. I think something enormous will be lost in exchange for that convenience. Studies have suggested that language shapes the way people interpret reality. Learning a different way to speak, read, and write helps people discover new ways to see the world. The experts I spoke to likened it to discovering a new way to think. As AI translation becomes normalized, we may find that we've allowed deep human connections to be replaced by communication that's technically proficient, but ultimately hollow. Yeah, I got to tell you, um, I am learning Spanish right now. Um, I do two lessons a week with a tutor um, in Colombia, and it has been a really invigorating and kind of challenging experience for me. And I really enjoy like the times I know I'm talking to somebody who knows some Spanish and I can get a little practice going back and forth. Like, it's really cool. Um, and for me, it is rewarding to kind of take it on. I wish I had done it when I was younger for a number of reasons. But that thing about the human connection part is real, man. Like, it, it, it's, it's a significant real thing. And we just so fucking lazy. Like, all I hear in that is, it's just laziness, right? Like, this is the, the, the now we got calculators, sort of thing about all of it. And it's just like, all right, so you don't have to do this anymore. That's cool. But what are you doing otherwise? Like, it's not as though people are like, now I have the ease of doing this one thing so I can now apply myself and do these other fulfilling, nourishing things. Nah, y'all just looking at Instagram some more. I mean, I don't want to say y'all. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an unfair generalization. But you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like, this is, these easier and better are not perfectly substitutable terms. I think that's for me what it comes down to as much as anything else. And and better subjective, right? I think there's that aspect of soul and like culture and slang that's missing from AI translations whenever you try to right. like speak the language culturally. Yes. And I mean, there's a programmer element to it, right? Like no matter how it goes, there's going to be that language differs from country to country, even if you're ostensibly speaking the same language. I remember the first time I went to London, I got off the plane, like one of those you land at seven o'clock in the morning. I got to the desk at the hotel and that lady was telling me how to get to the lift and everything else, man. She might as well have been speaking a uh, uh, Thai, Vietnamese, anything. She should, she could have been, sp I mean, it didn't matter what it was. Portuguese, she could have been speaking anything. I didn't know what it was. I was like, oh, English. I guess I am in the land where English is, got started, but still. All right, Bo, here's our next clip. Hi. My name is Marisa Gerber, and I'm a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times. Last week, I wrote about the rise and fall of MedMen, a one-time giant in the world of retail cannabis and how a company once valued at well over a billion dollars is now teetering on collapse. MedMen was an early darling in California's recreational pot market, 
and the company that called itself the Apple Store of Weed expanded rapidly, opening boutique pot shops across California and a handful of other states. But problems quickly followed. The company faced a flurry of lawsuits alleging mismanagement and a failure to pay its bills, and earlier this year, MedMen CEO stepped down, and the company was suspended on the Canadian Stock Exchange, where it had been traded. Then, a few weeks ago, most of the MedMen locations in California abruptly shut down, at least for now. MedMen was undone in part by internal turmoil, but this is also a story of larger market forces impacting the cannabis industry in California. For one, there is way more competition now than a few years ago, including the rapid spread of unlicensed dispensaries selling products for far cheaper than places like MedMen. And many of the industry's other challenges stem from the reality that they're still selling a product, pot, that the federal government considers a Schedule One drug alongside heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. Yo, um, I didn't know that MedMen was calling itself the Apple Store of Weed. I just thought other people called it the Apple Store of Weed because it was definitely the Apple Store of Weed. And at one point, it was humming, man. They had all the stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, you knew that you could get it. But I think there's one thing about that model, and I'm sure, like, what they're talking about is mismanagement and everything else. But the truth is, man... People like they weed, man. People do not want to buy weed at the Apple store, right? So, like, you go to dispensaries when you're in California, and it's a big difference between dispensaries in New York, right? Like, you go to dispensaries in California, man, them, you, them cats is high right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, 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 you start asking them questions, you go talk to them in adjectives, and they can turn that into something immediately, right? They're like, oh, I know exactly what it is that you want. Da, da, da. You ask them about the inventory, everything else. They got that. They, you know, they go, you know, this is the thing I grow up in my house and they, you know, all of this stuff. But there's a real like intimacy to that process that overwhelmingly, I think, is what most of these shoppers that we're talking about want. In New York, for example, they're leaning in a lot on equity. Right. And so they got a lot of people that have got popped for charges in the past and they paying it forward by letting them work at the weed store. And I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. It's cool to hear that that's what they're doing, but what that got to do with me and this weed I'm trying to buy? You know what I'm saying? Like, you can, you, I'm sure you learned a lot of things there. I'm sure you could tell me about the pitfalls of the criminal justice system, and maybe we could talk about that a little bit later. But right now, I got some writing to do tonight, and I was just wondering if you got anything that might be cool for that. They don't know. They don't know. You know, and so, like, this is a great example, and it's happening like it's gonna happen with the mushroom stuff when that starts getting going. But I think a thing to look at, not to explain this totally, but just something to consider, is this is what happens with the commercialization of this stuff. And you got people that I don't think really understand what it is on the ground that consumers themselves are truly looking for um, in making this happen, right? But the other part, and this is where I thought was interesting. In this story, we start talking about the issue being mismanagement, and this was once valued at a billion dollars, and now they seem on the verge of collapse. It sounds like another company where basically you were just setting this up to get the value off, and your plan was always to bail in the first place. You just were there to sell an idea, and the idea was Apple Store of Weed. And you're like, cool, okay, we could do that. Y'all need to get to that IPO a lot faster. And, you know, she, she mentioned in the article, but there's so many other companies that are replicating what MedMen does so well, but significantly mm -hmm. better, like that more human touch and less like, let me pop in this iPad and see what kind of products are available for me versus, like you said, having someone have a relationship with and be like, this is what I had last week. I need recommendations this week. Yeah, this isn't meant to be, this isn't meant to be big business. Like this is, and this is why I think they've also seen part of it is pricing, obviously, but where they can't get rid of the underground market, like even in California, to a degree, this still holds. They can't push the underground market out because people like that. You know, like in the end, they like the dude, they complain about him, they're like, damn, I got to wait for him to get off work, whatever it is. But like, they like playing that game more than they like this cold, impersonal touch. And this is a product that people have a very intimate relationship with. That's all we're saying. All right, Bo, here's our final clip for If You Haven't Heard. I'm Erin Snodgrass, a news reporter with Business Insider. Here's who could be responsible for paying for the Baltimore Bridge disaster. The Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed on Tuesday after a large container ship ran into it, leading to six deaths and millions of dollars in damages. Several entities could be on the hook to foot the bill in the aftermath of the disaster. 
President Joe Biden has said the federal government should be responsible for paying to reconstruct the damaged bridge, which could cost upwards of $600 million, according to Sky News. Meanwhile, the companies who had cargo on board the ship could ultimately be stuck covering some of the ship's damages and cargo costs because of an ancient maritime law known as General Average, which ensures all parties who have a vested interest in the ship are equally sharing its risk. It's still too early, however, to know for sure whether damages incurred to free the stuck ship will qualify as a general average case. The majority of the financial fallout is likely to lay with the maritime insurance industry, which could pay out losses for bridge damage, port disruption, and loss of life. The ship is covered by the Britannia Steamship Insurance Association, which is one of 12 mutual insurers included in the international group of P&I clubs. They maintain more than $3 billion of reinsurance cover for disasters like this. Bro, this all sound like the time machine. I heard ancient maritime law. What was it? The <laughs> Britannia Steamship Service. Like, it looked like this involves a lot of stuff that nobody's looked at in a very long time. Like, when it was time to get to the bottom of this, this stuff ain't even got uploaded to the database yet. They had to go on the shelf and get a dusty book off to try to figure out who there is to do like can you imagine if you was the one that they came to tell you that you bore responsibility for this and they tried to explain it to you using the words ancient maritime law can you imagine how hard you would roll your eyes and they're like well according to ancient ancient Mar ancient maritime law a ancient maritime has no idea what 600 million dollars is that didn't exist back then <laughs> Saying. Man, I hope they get that right. I just thought y'all would find that interesting. I don't know if I have anything else to say that won't be crass, but, you know, thoughts and prayers. All right, Bo, today's voicemail topic was if a family member or friend or yourself had an obsession with an artist along the lines of some of these big Beyonce fans, and uh, we got some three good ones for you. Hi, Bomani. My name is Anne, and I'm very excited you finally asked a question that I have an answer to. I'm going to call it myself as the biggest fan of the band Hanson. Not true. I'm not the biggest fan, but I have seen over 70 times I've seen them live in concert. Been going to their shows since the year 2000. I now take my 16-year-old son. He's been traveling around the country with me to see this band. He saw them in the womb. I went when I was pregnant. Um, I've met the band. I stood in line at malls to see this band. They're probably not the greatest band, but they're my favorite. I grew up with them. And you're great. I love the show. Thanks for sticking around. Bye. Yeah, I got to say, um, I applaud your dedication to Hanson. And if you were watching this on YouTube, you saw me make all those faces. And the only reason I made all those faces is I had no idea they were still in the league. Did you know they were still in the league, Sean? No, I, that was the biggest shock for me. It was like, I can't believe they're still touring um, and have more than three songs to tour with. But it seems like they, they do. It seems like people are still Yo. watching them. And, you know, because they are talented. Like, I do remember that, that they were not an untalented uh, bunch. But you know what this tells me? And I think we need to talk a lot more about this. I want to send a shout out to Mr. and Mrs. Hansen, because these boys are brothers. And they have been doing this now for like 30 something years. And they still together. Think about that for a second. It's a band that's still together. They ain't falling out. Their parents did an amazing job. Good job to you guys. And wow, I'm looking at a picture of these boys, and they look like they sing whack music about Jesus. Like a modern picture. Go look at, go, go find, like, go to their wiki page. And I was like, yeah, they look like they sing terrible songs about Jesus. And look, just because it's about Jesus don't mean the song can't be bad. They look like they sing bad songs about Jesus. But they still out here, and that's what's up. I had no, no, wow. Wow. Learn something new every day, Sean. I remember getting a, my, the first Hanson CD at the local Sam Goody. That was, that was, that was wow. my experience with them. I did not realize. Yeah, I guess there was still a Sam Goody with Hanson was out there. Or and coconuts. Shout out to 
Yeah, I got to say this. Um, and admitting her Hanson fandom was one thing. You doing it is a completely different act. <laughs> All right, on to the next one. Hey, Bo. Name's Jason, calling from um, Valley Stream in Long Island. But as you can tell by my voice, I'm from Georgia, Albany, Georgia. And my mom, she's a big fan of Southern male soul singers from back in the day. Johnny Taylor, Tyrone Davis, especially Marvin Cease. Every time we had a cookout when Marvin Cease played, she just went ahead and lost her mind, especially with candy liquor. And when Johnny Taylor died, I was in the car with her, came on the radio. I had to pull, I had to grab the wheel because she said she couldn't drive no more. <laughs> anyway, man, enjoying the new format of the show. And, you know, like best, like with the Evening Jones and the Sports Talk mix. I'm loving it, man. Take care. Bye. I appreciate you, brother. And, um, Candy Lick is her jam, huh? Play something else. Sean, Sean, Sean. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, come on. Uh, what's up, bro? This is Mike Collin from Houston, H Town. I'm actually from Huntsville. You know a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk about my older brother, who was a big time Lil Flip fan. Granted, we in Houston. And that's my big brother. That was my hero growing up. So I was a Lil Flip fan during the time. Wasn't no big issue because Lil Flip was the man when we was coming up in H Town. You, you, you know about that. Um, but then he got in a beef with T.I. And. During that whole period of time, I had to pretend to not like, I like my beat down low. I had to pretend to not like what you know about that. I had to pretend to not like motivation. I had to pretend to not like ASAP. Man, you don't know me, got me. When he, you might have seen me in the street, you don't know me. And it had a hand gesture, and I had to pretend to never like that hand gesture. And it's all because my big brother was the biggest little flip fan ever. And I still hold that against him a little bit. I don't, like, I love those songs, but I don't have the reverence other people have with him because I was hating the whole time they was out. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's my that's my story of uh, having a family member that's way too big a fan uh, of an artist. Uh, you know what I'm going to end this with a question, though. Did Pimp C make it hard for you to live in Atlanta briefly? Because I know you have to tell them that you were from the Houston area. Did he make it difficult on you? You don't got to go into detail because the clips are out there. But did he make it hard on you? I just kids and I love the show. Peace. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, when, when Pimp was doing all that stuff, I wasn't in Atlanta. But I want to get back to the fact that you you rode for your brother so hard that you were standing on business for Lil Flip. Tough. Like that was that was it. You were you were you were there, Sean. He was he was on. He was not. He had to. He and by the way, didn't Ti wash him? That I remember. And you know, it's like at the peak of Ti's career versus Lil Flip's career, yes. kind of like flandre. Yes. Hey man, look, Lil Flip said he spilled spilled drink on my clothes. I can do that. And I was like, "Wow, what a, what a thing to be able to do!" Like when I when I when I when I go through and list all my superpowers, being able to spill a drink on my clothes was not that that really wasn't the that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go in. Like that was up there what I was thinking. Like I had a good friend, God bless her soul, and her mama, God bless her soul too. Her mama loved Luther Vandross so much that she could tell if you even touched the Luther Vandross CDs. You know what I'm saying? Like, if there was any alteration. Like, there's some people, they out here, they not trying to hear nothing because, I mean, me and Spencer are going to do this podcast on Wednesday. I got a bat in the hatches. I have a lot of things to say. I'm, I got to, might have to take down. It's got some good songs. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much. Uh, for, oh, hold on, Sean. Do we have a, uh, we got, we got, we got prize picks I, I for the people? I popped in there right at the right time to, uh, Give some picks for prize picks because we're back in April. Uh, Caitlin Clark, 32 and a half points. I'll take less. Angel Reese, 18 and a half points. I'll take less. And Flaw J. Johnson, 15 and a half points. I'll take less. Uh, it's April Fools. I'm taking more across the board, guys. Don't, <laughs> ah, don't slip. There we go. There. I, I, was, I, was, I was a little shocked, but they, thank you for reminding me. And also, thank all you guys that work here. For not engaging in no bullshit today. I ain't here for these pranks. I just want to. I just want to make sure everybody knows this from here on out. Like for the future of our relationship. And you know what April first is in my world, and I'll say it right now. Happy 60th anniversary to Mac and Barbara Jones. Feel me.
That's true, by the way. I didn't make that up. That is the truth. Happy anniversary to my people. But ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this three times a week. That's what man Sean and you handling everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Also, thank you to our If You Haven't Heard contributors. Thanks to Louise Matsakis. Uh, check out her story in The Atlantic about the end of foreign language education. Thanks to Marisa Gerber of The LA Times. Check out her story about the collapse or the, the difficulty, shall we say, of med men. And thanks to Erin Snodgrass of Business Insider. Check out her story about who could be responsible for paying for the Baltimore Bridge disaster. Remember, follow the right time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And by the way, just to let you know, coming up soon, we have a uh, YouTube series of the great hip-hop albums of the great hip-hop year of 1994. Look out for it. Take it easy.